here. I was grateful um, on behalf of the unit and also on behalf of the, of the ministry for your interest and for participating. Just a couple of words about SUPERA and the role of RFOs. SUPERA is a Horizon 2020 project coordinated by the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, whose main objective is to achieve gender equality in research through structural change. The main activities in this project are the design and implementation of gender equality plans in four universities and two research funding organizations. The two RFOs involved in SUPRA are the Spanish Ministry on Science and Innovation, particularly for the funding activities of our state research agency, and also the Regional Authority of Sardinia, which is a regional RFO. Our ambition with this task is to create a network of research funding organizations to exchange experiences, obstacles, promising practices specifically for research funding organizations. This is why we have launched this series of webinars that have been kindly organized by Yellow Window. And we hope that this would be a starting point for future collaborations and mutual learning between state and regional agencies in the framework of the SUPRA project. We have also developed a living tool to collect experiences um, on gender equality measures from and for research funding organizations. And this tool will be presented at the end of the webinar. Today, we will have the opportunity of listening and learning from the experience of two regional research funding organizations implementing gender equality policies, the Regional Authority of Sardinia and the Vienna Science and Technology Fund. Please consider that our future webinars will be more thematic and mm -hmm. concentrate on concrete measures. The next one will be next Wednesday and will be focused on gender bias in the evaluation process. Regarding practicalities, uh, please consider that the webinar will be recorded and this will be published online. So in case you don't want to appear, you may anonymize yourself, keep your camera off. Um, please send your questions using the chat for the, um, for the end of the session. And please keep your microphones muted during our presentations. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this first webinar that come from um, the SUPRA project and a sister project, which is GICO. First, I'll give the floor to Tara Marini from the Regional Authority of Sardinia, and then to Elizabeth Nagel and Donia Lassinger from the Vienna Science and Technology Fund. At the end, we will have a, a space for exchange uh, with the audience, so you can make your questions. And this will be facilitated by Alain Denis from Yellow Window. Tara Marini is an expert in international cooperation, European projects and institutional communication. Since 2004, she started working in the field then she specialized in the US with a master's degree at Boston College in European policies and Euro-Mediterranean cooperation. She worked in the US on a research project for improving the integration of ethnic minorities at Yale University. Returning to Italy, she provided her experience in projects concerning local development, environment, and the drafting of a program on these issues in 2008. Since 2011, she has been working for the Autonomous Region of Sardinia in European projects and institutional communication. So I stop sharing. And Tara. Thank you very much, Lydia. And uh, thanks to everybody for being here. I will present the, the experience of the Autonomous Region of Sardinia and our uh, successful system of alliances. Uh, here uh, is where we started from. 
The law for research and innovation in Sardinia, which is a law of 2007, the regional law number seven, and is a specific provision for research and innovation in Sardinia. It concerns uh, uh, the enhancement of scientific culture in the island, uh, or the development of human capital, of internationalization of the research system, and of the rationalization of research system. And more, it provides integration between basic and applied research. It is a law that uh, provided uh, uh, to the research system in Sardinia 180 million euro over 12 years, so it's a big uh, amount of money. However, it did not have any reference to, to gender issues. So that is why I put uh, the picture of a golden egg. It was uh, an opportunity for us, uh, a golden egg uh, to, to start uh, to beginning our uh, to begin our gender policies. And uh, I have a, a problem in, um, in moving to the following slide. Uh, so uh, why uh, we wanted to um, develop a gender equality plan? Because we carried out an analysis uh, in the project submitted uh, in the call for proposal of law seven. And uh, we discovered that the 34% of projects were submitted and funded by women, and the 66% was funded by men. This uh, reproposed the same ratio of male and female researchers in Sardinia. However, for us, it, is not, it was not enough because we wanted to decrease the bias, not to repropose it. That is why we developed a gender uh, equality plan in the framework of the SUPERA project. We chose to work in the SUPERA project because we considered it very important to have exchange of experiences and best practices with all the, uh, the SUPERA group. Where we started, uh, which were our assumptions. Sardinia, um, we knew that we were one of the first regions in Italy in the creation of a JAP. So we felt uh, a little bit like pioneers. We were enthusiastic by the task, but we had a big uncertainty on the way to proceed because we didn't know, uh, we didn't have any point of reference uh, in the national legal framework uh, concerning uh, gender equality plans. However, we were aware of the potential of expertise of our stakeholders and uh, we knew uh, what they could provide. Ah, ecco là. Ci sono. And uh, um, we, mm, we know also that the generality of our employees had a lack of specialization in gender issues, except some particular figures like the Authority for Equal Opportunity uh, and other colleagues, uh, uh, the generality of uh, employees was not specialized in gender issues. However, uh, our office had a consolidated experience in the relation with the political level and stakeholders because uh, we are a programming center, so we did it, uh, we do it as a mission, and uh, uh, we were aware of that. Uh, moreover, we were uncertain about the political support uh, because of upcoming election. The previous government was supporting our project, but we didn't know anything about the future government. And uh, we had uh, as, uh, as a prize also the possibility to expand experience to other sources of funding. And uh, uh, so uh, the gender equality plan could uh, uh, be also something that could be spread to different sources. Why we developed our system of alliances? Because uh, uh, we knew that it provided a, ba a largest basis of consensus because uh, it, uh, uh, we knew also that it ensured the awareness to a wider system. And uh, uh, we were aware of the fact that it was key for the effectiveness of the JEP. Uh, our system was based on three levels, basically. The first one uh, inside our office, the Regional Programming Center, with our stakeholders. Uh, external stakeholders that worked together with us. The second level, the whole regional administration, and the third level outside the regional administration with different networks. 
They start from the, the regional programming center. Here you can see the picture of our office. And uh, uh, we started uh, creating two gender hubs, uh, the first one with our stakeholders and the second one with the responsible and the people that were working uh, in the uh, regional law seven team. Uh, these gender hubs uh, occurred in um, several meetings and uh, uh, after those meetings we prepared a report with stakeholder suggestion, we drafted the gender equality plan and uh, uh, in, um, at the same time we were drafting the reference to the gender equality plan in official documents. Uh, throughout the whole process, we carried out an information and constant awareness rising of uh, our political and our technical leadership in gender issues through informal meetings, also through formal meetings, but uh, much was carried out uh, through informal one ones. Here you can see the, how our stakeholders that participated to the, uh, the Gender Hub, Giulia Giornalista, which is an association of women journalists, very, um, uh, very keen on gender issues. Sardegna Ricerche, which is the agency that deals with the regional law seven call for proposal, the formats, which is an institution for um, training, the Council for Equal Opportunities that inside the regional administration provides uh, support for ensuring the application of equal opportunities, the Commission for Equal Opportunities, that is a commission that, uh, that provides the same task. The University of Cagliari that we consider necessary because uh, they gave uh, us uh, really many suggestions concerning the researchers uh, and concerning the world uh, of uh, uh, the uh, women and men that were applying uh, uh, to the regional law seven proposal the CORICOM the regional committee for communication the Council for Equality of the Metropolitan Area of Cagliari and the uh, CRS4 which is a research center very active in the island. So here you can see the different steps of the creation of, uh, of the JEP from the analysis to the listening to the uh, drafting of the JEP. And now we go to the second level, the level of the regional administration, the whole regional administration, which is a very wide institution in Sardinia with many offices. Therefore, we carried out an interaction with other offices in the region that manage different uh, funds and uh, the structural funds, but also funds uh, um, uh, provided uh, by the uh, region. We uh, inserted the principle in the regional development plan, which is the uh, programming document, which is valid for the whole administration for a period of four years. And we carried on uh, an interaction with the Council for Equal Opportunity and the Commission for Equal Opportunities that provided us a lot of useful data and a lot of uh, hints for confrontation uh, and for uh, uh, improving our job. We offer training to different branches, and during the period of imp the implementation of the JEP, we are going to carry the, uh, to carry this activity of training, and we have a very close interaction with the staff office that provided us with a lot of data about the gender situation in the region of Sardinia, in the autonomous region of Sardinia. We have an interaction with the agency involved in the call for tenders, and we are benefiting for the opportunities with other funds. In particular, for example, the ERDF technical assistance. And finally, our third level, outside the regional administration, the networks, we develop uh, a, a relation with the different networks involved. At first, the network of external stakeholder, the networks uh, of CINECA, which is the committee uh, responsible for the evaluator of regional law seven, the network of the regional research council, the super network that was really used for for us to grow, to exchange a lot of suggestions, uh, best practice, uh, and to develop together this gender equality plan and also to spread uh, uh, outside what we were doing. Uh, I'm here thanks to the Supera presenting this uh, experience. 
the ERDF, uh, which is very informed by uh, gender equality opportunities. And uh, uh, there is a network of the regional authorities for equal opportunities that is strictly connected to the ERDF that uh, uh, provides the integration of equal opportunity inside the structural fund programs. And uh, uh, so it is very useful to, uh, to exchange practices and to also inform the other regional authority of what we were doing. And uh, the research funding organization, and we are carrying, uh, uh, we have in progress uh, an activity of networking with a national operative program of research. Now we can see the benefits. What were the benefits of building this system of alliances? First, we uh, prepared a shared gender equality plan that now is applicable to regional law seven, but can be spread and diffused to other programs. We inserted the principles of gender equality and of supera and of the gender equality plan in the programming system, thus making it a rule and ensuring the sustainability of uh, uh, the project. We are working to spread the best practices to ERDF and our programs, and uh, we are benefiting from the technical assistance from other funds, in particular the ERDF. As you may know, the technical assistance of uh, uh, structural funds in the different regions has a lot of, uh, uh, is a very rich technical assistance that can provide a lot of services. So our, the technical assistance from ERDF provide us uh, with a lot of data of the gender integration of the gender principles uh, in the ERDF uh, and in the research project. We have a formal approval by the Regional Council for Research, which is in contact with the national uh, biggest institution that works with research. We have a provision from the executive government that inserted the gender equality in the law, thus making it uh, a rule. And uh, we can benefit uh, by a continuous chance of improvement from the exchange from the super consortium and networks, because uh, uh, networks give you the chance of improve yourself and of hearing different practices, of taking hints, taking suggestions. And uh, another thing very important about having a system of alliances is that you have many supporters and supporters and guardians of the effectiveness of the JEP, because uh, you uh, you are responsible in front of uh, many people. You have to show what you have done, and you have to um, uh, ask yourself questions, give yourself answers, and see if you are uh, uh, complying to what uh, you uh, foresee in the in the documents. Here you can see the different references, uh, the integration of super principles in the regional redevelopment plan, which is uh, an executive act, the, the act of the JEP approval, the acknowledgement of the uh, gender equality plan by the Council for Research, and right now we are carrying out the activity to insert it in the executive provision uh, for regional law seven. Mm, for the following three years, we will have uh, the implementation of the JEP, and uh, uh, so we are uh, securing its uh, sustainability. What are the hints from our experience? What we learned in our systems of alliances and can be useful for other organizations? The nice things to remark is that the same uh, suggestions that you apply to a system of alliances are the same suggestion that you apply to human resource management. For example, shared goals in the alliance, find a common ground in the alliance, a common interest, and uh, um, use it as a, a glue to keep together the whole alliance, uh, establish share goal with the alliance, carry out a continuous communication with stakeholders and partners in all the phases of the project, not only when their support uh, is necessary, but also when uh, uh, there are moments of uh, emptiness in the project, but keep uh, your their interest high so that they will be more, uh, they will feel more on board, uh, being informed the whole time. Informal dialogue is as important as formal because uh, uh, before the acts, before the law, before everything, there are the phone calls, the informal talks uh, in the offices, uh, the exchange of opinion that lead uh, to more formal achievements. 
give value to the diversity of uh, the different stakeholders. We are starting ICTA from the team of Supra inside our regional programming center. We are a team that have very different competencies and we glue these competencies together to build a successful project. The same thing we are doing it with the stakeholders. As you can see uh, from the description before, our stakeholders had competencies uh, in different uh, um, issues all connected to create a, a good gender equality plan. Give the highest possible empowerment to, to each member. Uh, do, of course, in the framework of the institutional framework, but uh, give them the possibility to make the difference, uh, to do something for the, for the project and the documents uh, and the things that you are preparing. Give always feedback to allies. If you cannot accept a suggestion by one of them, explain why, explain uh, um, the fact that you are not accepting it and uh, because of this reason and uh, tell them if it is a good suggestion if in other uh, period uh, will, will be applied uh, or um, anyway the feedback is very important uh, share the activities and the responsibilities according the uh, tasks and the competencies of each member of the alliance and give visibility to each member of the alliance this is very important because they will feel also uh, they are getting a prize for what uh, uh, they are doing a sort of uh, a recognition of what they are doing. In the autonomous region of Sardinia, for example, we realized the video with the contribution of all our stakeholders, and this will become a promotional video that would be spread inside the administration and also to the external public, and it will be very important for us to have this, uh, um, this visibility of the team, of the stakeholders, and of everyone that contributed to the project. And uh, uh, one of the last suggestions that was very important is not being limited to what was planned. Consider window of opportunities. At the beginning of a project, we had a certain idea to prepare a gender equality plan, but during the, pro the project, a lot of uh, opportunities emerged and we were able to uh, create more than we thought. Uh, that was why, because we were looking at a window of opportunities and we took uh, benefits from them. And finally, connected with the window of opportunities are the formula documents. Everybody that work in a public administration know that a formula document doesn't make 100%, of course, but it paves the way, it opens doors, it creates the culture to introduce structural change and uh, to change the behavior of the people. So formal documents uh, are very important. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to everybody. And a special thank to the Autonomous Region of Sardinia team, uh, which was a wonderful team. And uh, our uh, head of team Gianluca Cadeddu, Massimo Carboni, Simona Corongiu, Antonio Mura, uh, Stefania Aru, Manuela Muru, and it was wonderful to work with them. Uh, and also our allies, the super partners, our stakeholders, our networks. For any question, please feel free to contact me and my email address, tmarini at regione.sardegna.it. Thank you. I guess that Massimo wants to intervene now. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. No, just I uh, wanted to say something to thank Tara uh, on the, um, all the partners. And I was wondering if she was saying it, it was a good team. I hope it's still a good team now because we have so many things to do. <laughs> so we still have some work for the next, uh, the next few years. So just to want to say thanks to Tara and to all the participants, especially the Italian ones that we run uh, for the invitation uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara Massimo. Let me share again the screen. Okay. To present. Okay to introduce 
our next speakers. Donia Lassinger is Deputy Managing Director of the Vienna Science and Technology Fund. In this organization, she is responsible for the Vienna Research Groups for Young Investigators Program, a funding scheme to bring young excellent researchers to Vienna. Moreover, she is partner in diverse national and European projects in the sphere of responsible research and innovation, gender evaluation and strategy development. Donia Lassinger studied economic sciences in Austria and Ireland and is an expert in strategy and innovation management. Elizabeth Nagel is program manager. She is primarily responsible for the pilot project called Environmental Systems Research Urban Environments. In addition, she is also the responsible for public relations activities and gender mainstreaming at the Vienna Science and Technology Fund. Elizabeth studied law and economics with a specialization in strategic management, as well as geography with a focus on economic and social geography at the University of Salzburg and at Lund University, Sweden. So please, Donia and Elizabeth, the floor is yours. If you want to share. Thank you. I will start sharing the presentation. And I will start talking. Elizabeth and I, we will have kind of a lively um, duo uh, presentation. So I will do the first part and then we will have quite a nice exchange and flip-flopping between each other. Um, I think you have to start the presenter mode, Elizabeth. I know, I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to do so. In the meantime, I, I will thank you for giving us the opportunity to present today and for enabling this discussion. It's really interesting and the first presentation was very nice and um, you will see there are a lot of similarities, but we will now present a little bit from a different angle as we are another organization, another kind of organization. And I will, will guide you through this. Still waiting for the technical issues to be solved. Yes. I somehow. I think you have to sh to get go again to screen sharing and then. I yeah I am at the screen sharing. I'm sorry I have tried this before during the test and it worked, but now uh, no. Almost there. <laughs> So, sorry. Wonderful. So what we would like to present today to you is just to give you a short introduction about who we are, uh, what we are doing, just to set a little bit of the frame and then tell you a little bit about the already mentioned sister project GICO, which has quite similar goals like Supera. Um, and then we go into detail about our structural cultural um, change and we will discuss this as five steps and then we will summarize it and Elizabeth will summarize it in the end, what were the supporting and inhibiting factors, what were the results, reflections and lessons learned. So let me just jump into who we are and what we do. So we are a basic funding organization, we're a nonprofit organization, we are private. And we were established to promote science and research and mainly in Vienna. So we are a very local or regional actor as we only fund science or mainly fund science in Vienna. And we also act mainly in Vienna. We were founded like 18 years ago, more than 18 years ago and funding um, since 2003 our fund, in our funding programs. And we have given away over 200 million euros since then which comes from a private funding organization, private funding foundation, but also from the city of Vienna. So we have like both, we have like private and public money that we're spending. Um, just a little bit to our mission. So what are we doing? So we are mainly funding top scientific research in Vienna as already mentioned. And we do this by providing substantial funding for larger research projects and also for bringing top talent to Vienna in our personal funding program. And we do that by competitive cause 
and um, this is centered along thematic programs. We will show you a little bit in the next slide, but this we all do this by very transparent and international standards. So the whole uh, competition and the whole evaluation is done by international peers and international juries. Just to give you a little bit about our size, we are a small organization compared to our public um, funders that are also here in Austria. We only have, or we have three calls per year, about 15 million euros uh, per year we are spending. And this results in around 15 projects and around two young researchers that come to Vienna. So what we also would like to concentrate a little bit is um, this kind of smallness, um, this smallness, but we are also flexible. So we are a team of eight people. And we was also talk about this embeddedness and involvement in this regional policy dialogue and networks. And I think this really is nicely kind of following through what we've heard in the previous uh, presentation about this network and about these people and that are centered around us. So um, just giving you a quick look what we're doing. So as we are small, we have to focus on certain thematic programs and you see them there, life sciences being one of the oldest one, but also having other priorities like the one environmental systems research that Elizabeth is responsible for and our funding instruments, which are also restricted to only certain instruments. But let me uh, just go to the next one of what our role in gender equality is. So really the main opportunity for us was nearly four years ago when we joined the EU project GECO. And the goals are kind of similar, the structure is kind of similar to, to Superior as you will see. So here it was also like four universities together with two research funding organizations should implement gender equality plans or as for the RFOs, it's not a gender equality plan per se, but it's like implementing changes in funding schemes, programs, and review processes. So we, the two funding organizations, is Toucher, it's the Czech um, uh, funder, and, and us, we didn't have like a CHEP per se, but we implemented changes, structural and cultural changes. What was the initial situation before we joined the project? Um, now we had individual measures in place, but we didn't have a systematic approach. And this is really good that this changed during the, the process of the EU project, and I will, we will guide you through this. So for the next parts, Elizabeth will present in more detail what we did in these five steps. And I will then jump in and give you a little bit of a kind of a flavor of the advantages and disadvantages of being the organization that we are so small and flexible. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, as Danya mentioned, I will just um, guide you through this process of changes that we had at WWTF and the different steps of it. So um, one of the first things that we realized that we had to do was to build up uh, knowledge um, and a gender friendly culture internally. So in our organization. Um, so there was little knowledge on gender, specifically on gender in research in our organization before we started Chico. As Donia mentioned, we only had um, measures here and there or actions, but not um, really in-house knowledge on, on, on the bigger picture, so to say. So um, we had a lot of internal discussions. We had a lot of um, awareness raising workshops and also trainings uh, within the project Chico, but also um, external support. So we um, had external support um, to, to accompany us in this process, so to say. And this was important um, to really also um, build up this knowledge what the changes we wanted to were really about and also to um, prevent uh, any resistances within the organization. Um, what we could profit from was an intensive analysis, analysis um, of the topic gender in research funding organizations, which we did at, as part of the project Chico. And this was a, a good starting point for us to place gender as a cross cutting issue in our organization. So the advantage was really to be a small team. So it was very easy to reach everyone as a few persons needed to be on board to raise this awareness. The disadvantage on the other side was really 
that these people had more weight in the discussion and really had to convince nearly everyone, or you had to convince everyone to be on board. Advantage again of a small team, we had no complex inter internally, we had a flat hierarchy, and we had a lot of exchange, which was very, very helpful for the learning loops and also for the exchange along the change process. So then um, as a next step, what we also realized that we would need was to provide evidence that there is actually a need for action, a need for a change. So uh, the first prerequisite for this was to analyze our status quo internally so of course regarding gender um, we did that by um, dividing or uh, splitting up our the different stages of the process in our organization so the different steps that we usually do with our day-to-day -day work so everything that has to be done before we launch a call then everything that is done during a call and a call execution, then the post-processing, so to say, and cross-cutting matters. Um, and then uh, also within these four steps, uh, we realized that we needed to uh, make a more in-depth uh, analysis of uh, sex disaggregated data of different indicators. So we already had this in place in um, let's say uh, uh, a more uh, minor uh, status, um, but then we extended it by, by the kind of um, data that we examined and the indicators that we examined. So for example, the number of applicants versus successful applicants by um, women and men, the numbers of reviewers, uh, jury members, jury chairs, the average uh, grant size by sex and a number of other indicators, which I have not all listed here. And then um, we also, uh, by also this report that I mentioned before, by this analysis of other funding organizations, um, really getting to know the situation in our environment, what others already do, what works for others and what doesn't work for others. And here again, it was really an advantage being a small organization as it was very easy to access numbers and to collect them. On the other side, we had no elaborated monitoring system in place and it had all been done by hand, which was sometimes really, really hard. Also, we have the problem, I would say, of small numbers and of small sample size. As I've shown you, we only have three calls per year. So the sample size of looking about results or what, you know, what comes out of it is quite limited. On the other hand, we had a very broad network with a lot of external expertise and input, and we always had to balance it against wishes that were kind of, we were confronted with a lot of wishes that the outside world wanted us to do, and we had to solve everything uh, with limited resources, but I think we kind of handled it right um, and well. Also very interesting was the process about selecting the best examples, as Elizabeth mentioned. So we were looking at other research funding organizations, how they are doing, and we always had to look how to compare their processes and what they are doing in their task with our ones, as they are quite different organizations, different from, you know, by law or how they are. Are they private? Are they public? Do they fund like applied research or basic ones? So there we had to search for very similar structures, similar legal status, and was but it was a very interesting process. Uh, so then, uh, what was uh, what seems like maybe a um, trivial step, but it, it's really crucial was to formulate clear goals and also what should not be in the focus of our goals and the measures to reach those goals. So um, we formulated a rather general overarching key objective, which was to gender mainstream our funding cycle um, of the existing programs and to improve in every step of this funding cycle. Uh, then, um, because this is a very general goal, we also formulated intermediary objectives and respective measures attached to these. So just to mention some examples, this was, uh, 
for example, to use gender neutral language in all our um, guidelines and documents, uh, for example, to increase or uh, where it's already a, a good status, retain the share of female jury members, um, to implement gender criteria as part of the selection process and a number more. So um, attached to these goals, it was important to be realistic and to have a clear plan for these um, goals. So what do we want to achieve with the respective goal? In which time frame should this be achieved? Who is the responsible person? And what influencing aspects can be identified? Um, so regarding the monitoring, uh, we were lucky again to be in the, the project Chico because um, as part of this um, project, uh, there was a monitoring tool developed, uh, which will also soon be um, published to, to monitor this change process. So uh, to really know what the status is, what the to do's are and so on. And here the main challenge was, as already mentioned with the step beforehand, that we had like different challenges when looking outside and, and comparing it to other research funding organizations, and mainly about if they are in the more applied funding schemes or in the more basic research as we are. And we saw that the applied partners were quite front runners as it was sometimes easier for them to include especially gender mainstreaming in research content aspects. So because humans are more likely to be involved in the projects and it was easier also for the researchers to answer the question how the content and how gender in the content is um, applied there. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the basic uh, research funding organizations, we saw that there was a high awareness in academia but it was challenging to include sex or gender considerations in research. And as we kind of made the first learning loops about this, about um, you know, the exchange with researchers, how they can include this gender and content perspective in our, in our funding schemes and in our projects. So um, after all this work of analyzing and, and setting goals, we then also wanted to implement the, the changes. And we did that um, by um, implementing these changes in a pilot initiative, rather than uh, implementing the changes in our entire portfolio uh, at the same time. So uh, we identified a window of opportunity, which seems to be a very popular approach. Uh, and this window of opportunity was for us uh, a call in the uh, area of environmental systems research mentioned before with a focus on urban uh, areas. So where there is also a, a relative uh, closeness to, to applied research, to social sciences and involvement of humans also given. So at that point, we just uh, realized that we wanted and needed to start even if we maybe had not found the perfect measures for everything at that point of time. Um, but that was an experience that we made um, that it's a bit of a balancing act between over analyzing and uh, providing evidence um, that there is a kind of danger of wanting to uh, having everything uh, perfectly sorted out, but still um, needing to, to act because of, of this uh, window of opportunity, which uh, would then close again, so to say. So a certain um, kind of pragmatism is also necessary or was necessary for us. And um, as we've already mentioned before, we had the chance to learn from others, from the experiences from others, but still uh, there was still a lot of learning by doing because um, on the one hand, um, there were already a set of measures um, tried out by others so that we could adopt some things. The wheel doesn't have to be reinvented, as I put it here. Uh, but um, in general, uh, funding organizations are quite different in the way they are organized, the way they are work. So it's hard to really copy paste measures from one institution to another. 
And here we had the advantage of flexibility. So speedy implementation and adjustments were easily possible, more easily possible, also because we have a flat hierarchy. So it was, you could include it quite quickly. Also, as Elizabeth mentioned, she was the one responsible for the call. So the topic was really situated at a very good place also for, for trying it out and she being involved in the GECO project. And nevertheless, um, it's very, very important to have consistency in the common topic or tom uh, common theme in order not to get lost. As we are quite flexible, we could try out anything, but we really have to focus and to stay in one stream and uh, not to, to overburden us or to get lost in all our meshes. Yeah, and then uh, finally, uh, of course, we did not want uh, the changes that we have tried out in this pilot initiative to end with this one initiative, but to consolidate this change in the institution. So what was important for us was to keeping colleagues involved and informed as they then would be more likely to um, include the, the knowledge and the experiences in um, other programs that they would be responsible for and also know about the purpose um, of the changes. Uh, then um, I've already mentioned the monitoring of the development and the changes. So um, that was also crucial to keep track of the status of the changes and um, also where there was still need for action. Another um, important uh, experience was to report success stories to the management. So as a certain kind of uh, legitimizing the implemented measures um, and show uh, that it made sense and that it worked in, in a specific area. But on the same time, of course, uh, there are still areas uh, where there is room for improvement so that's also important to identify these areas and uh, um, being able to, to improve um, the next time. And um, so ideally the successful learnings made in the first experiences in this pilot initiative in our case are then taken and used as a new standard for future actions. And in our case, uh, we could also institutionalize these changes, these implemented measures. Um, in our case, this was done by including all the changes in our internal handbook for the organization of calls. Um, and um, by this, this is, it's ensured that these um, experiences are not lost after this one um, initiative. So um, summing up, um, we also want to share with you some of the supporting and inhibiting factors that we made in our experience. Um, so uh, we are a private organization, we've mentioned that, and by that we have fewer restrictions than public RFOs in the way how we fund and what we fund. Also, we were not a first mover, so there were other organizations in our close environment that had already paved the way with their implemented uh, measures. Um, we were also embedded in different peer groups. So within the Project Chico, there was a, or there is a, an RFO observer group. We have a national or local working group of funding institutions regarding gender. And we also are part of a group of small regional RFOs from Germany and Austria, which we could all um, use as sparing partners for these changes. And uh, finally, uh, we took an, a holistic approach uh, for these changes. We implemented measures that were spanning an entire call for proposal and several dimensions of gender equality. So we implemented criteria for the gender balance in teams, for the gender dimension in research. We included expertise uh, on with gender in our juries. And um, then also the, the post processing, the monitoring, so to say. On the inhibiting side, so to say, um, 
private also means that we do not have to fulfill some requirements that public organizations do have to meet. For example, quotas in our decision-making boards in-house, so our advisory board, our board of directors. Um, being a small organization also means that we have little room for bigger structures. So um, implementing, for example, or installing a gender equality office is something that will most probably not um, happen in our organization because we are just too small for that. And thus we are depending a lot of individual engagement and persons that have this topic on their agenda. Um, so for the final summary of, of our reflections and lessons learned, um, we can already see that there is a positive tendency of our implemented changes, um, but we do not want to claim direct causality um, and impact because of course there are also a lot of other actors around us which are implementing changes and this might in part also result to their measures. Um, it was really crucial to build up this internal knowledge to prevent resistances so that everyone in the team is also aware of what the changes are, do really mean, what the purpose is and what the changes are about. Um, providing evidence that there is need for action was really an important step. Um, and of course, um, flagging an issue and raising awareness of it um, might uh, initiate discussions and chains. Of, of course, it's always um, nicer, so to say, to have direct influence, but um, if that's, that is not possible, then at least raising a point can also uh, be helpful. Um, as we've mentioned before, the networks that we were active in were really important to exchange on the experiences made. And uh, what is also important was the exchange between um, research institutions. So in our case, within the Project Chico, we had a, a research performing organization also active in Vienna, um, uh, which was really nice to have this direct ex exchange. But we also found that uh, this exchange between funding agencies and research institutions is often informal, which also has advantages as has been heard in the previous presentation but um, formal exchange is relatively seldom. And for us, this um, change process uh, framed within the pilot initiative was really a door opener for institutional change, for institutionalizing the changes and experiences made. So we want to thank you for uh, your attention. And we also want to point you to um, the other results made within the project Chico. So there are some literature reviews, some nice videos on um, different research areas and how to um, combine this with gender research. And we also have a set of um, documents specific to RFOs if you're interested in those. Thank you, Donia and uh, Elizabeth, and also Tara for these interesting uh, presentations. Uh, to the participants, uh, thank you to use the chat to formulate your questions. We are a relatively big group, so um, it's difficult to create an open discussion. We will start with some questions and answers, and then if time permits, we can maybe start a more open discussion and I can ask you to, um, to contribute. Um, we got a first question in the chat, which is already partly answered by Donia, but maybe Donia, you can uh, give the answer um, to, to the participants. It's really on how you uh, framed the gender in research content. Um, as you said, that it, this was one of the elements you tried to, to implement in, in the basic research. Exactly. So what we had already in place was um, gender in teams, so really about numbers, so how many female male researchers are in teams, but the one on gendering content was a very new 
um, was very new criterion for us. On the positive side, the other funding organization, as Elizabeth mentioned at the end of uh, the presentation, already had something similar in place. So the researchers were not really totally new to this kind of uh, criterion. So what we did is we um, included uh, a certain um, a part in the proposals to really elaborate on this part and also to give an explanation if the researchers think that this is not necessary in their research to address. So at least to, you know, to, to raise the awareness and that they think about it. <clears throat> what we also saw it, uh, that uh, we now did it for the third time in, so we, we, we started with a pilot call, but we went on and included it also in other uh, uh, project proposals. And uh, for the last one, it was in digital humanism where kind of an interdisciplinary research between social sciences, humanities and uh, information communication technology is necessary. And I got the feedback from the universities itself, from the gender experts at the universities that researchers really came to them and asked them is gender in, you know, is this, re is this important in our research? So there seems to be a process ongoing. And this is very important in this kind of partnership between research funding organizations and research performing organizations as Elizabeth, Elizabeth mentioned in the end. But uh, just one thing that I also wrote in the chat is I thought it was sometimes more difficult inside the organizations to raise the awareness. So to change this kind of culture and thinking that a basic funding organization has no research in content aspects. And this was a kind of a, of a procedure uh, that we did with training, with a lot of talking. Uh, we also um, included an external expert and we really looked at funded projects that we already funded and looked at them and uh, went through them and looked where there could be a gender in content uh, uh, aspect or already is. So, and, and I think through this project, the awareness raising was then elaborated and was going on. And this was very important not to only kind of uh, ask the researchers to, to put it in there, but also that we as an organization are really like, okay, basic research and there are some aspects that has to have to be considered. Thank you. And I also think what you what you did of preventing resistance by training everyone and creating the awareness of the full team at the start is probably a, a, an example of a good practice, uh, although easier to implement, as you said, in a, in a small organization. I see there are two questions um, that I will first maybe address to um, Tara and, and maybe uh, Massimo. Um, but also valid for sure also for um, WWTF. It's more on the monitoring, so the type of indicators and how you monitor your JEP uh, implementation and the impact that that you're uh, achieving. We, uh, for monitoring, uh, we put uh, many indicators in our JEP, some uh, uh, results indicators and also impact indicators. Our final indicators, the, the, the result of what we would love to achieve would be the increase of uh, uh, the percentage of female researchers assessing to the funds and uh, uh, presenting a proposal in regional law seven. But we have many indicators inside uh, the JEP that monitor our progresses. For example, the reference uh, of the project uh, inside the public documents, uh, the, the meetings we are able to organize with other institutions to, to spread the diffusion of the project, uh, the fact uh, that uh, uh, the project, uh, the activation, for example, of uh, friend desk that will help female researchers in presenting their call for proposal, especially those who have children or are more penalized by the fact that uh, um, uh, more penalized when the call for proposal comes out. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, all those indicators will help us to monitor the progress and we will examine them together with our stakeholders. So uh, if to see uh, if there are problems in implementing the JEP, uh, if some problems can be solved, uh, uh, we will think about possible solutions. Uh, and therefore, there will be um, really a way to see if the actions we are uh, um, implementing uh, will produce uh, a results. Uh, 
for example, there are also uh, other um, indicators connected uh, to the activities of training uh, um, and also to the activities of communication, how many people will be reached, uh, how many people will be trained, uh, uh, how uh, in the um, committee of evaluators uh, we will produce uh, an uh, ethic document to be signed by the evaluators which will make them aware of gender issues and therefore uh, um, this is another indicator uh, of the people that respect and see these documents so, um, and then of course we we will ask feedback to the stakeholders and our networks also to have an external opinion on how activities are carried out Elisabeth Rodonia, you want to elaborate? Also, you mentioned that in JECO there, there was a, an external partner uh, involved in, in supporting you for monitoring and evaluation as well, and, and that a tool or a result will be published soon. So maybe you can give some information on that. Oh, yes, so um, within the project JECO, um, there is a partner um, responsible for the for the monitoring uh, of the pre project Chico as a whole, but also uh, we had a collaboration with the RFO partners and um, we de developed this, this kind of uh, monitoring tool or um, yeah, uh, approach together. Um, as far as I know, we will, we will publish this at the end of the project or close to the end of the project. It's still being finalized on the Chico website. And it's basically um, uh, to insert all the actions, the measures, uh, the goals, uh, what you want to achieve with the change, uh, all these things that I've mentioned before, who is responsible, um, uh, how many resources are dedicated to it, um, uh, what is the time uh, schedule for it, um, are there any open to-dos? So this was really helpful for us. Um, to, to keep track of the changes because it was actually quite a number of things that we had running in parallel, so to say. Um, I am not sure if I should already um, then also go into detail on the question on, on the indicators and on impact or... Yes, I think you can, um, because there is also another question uh, related to that, as a matter of fact. Uh, so you can very well start uh, speaking about impacts. Yeah, so um, for, for some of the changes, it's uh, very clear um, for us um, if, if it was, um, if it would be our, our, so to say, impact, because um, the number of reviewers uh, or the share of female reviewers that we um, approach in a call that's um, clearly only influenced by ourselves. Um, whereas there are others like the number of female applicants, um, if there is an initiative by some universities to increase the share of female applicants in, in third party funding projects, then that's something which is not um, only due to our increase of awareness or our implemented criteria. So I think that's really hard to um, divide who is responsible, so to say, for which changes. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. The, there is another question to Tara and or uh, Massimo. Um, on this impact you managed to have on the European Regional De Development Fund. So this approach you took to, okay, you, you concentrate on research and law seven, but you uh, managed to uh, multiply your impacts of your JEP by applying the same principles uh, on other funding schemes and funding schemes which are not funding research, they are funding local development. So uh, maybe to elaborate on how you managed to do that. So what is the link um, uh, and, and the trigger to, uh, to create this, uh, passage from one to the other. There is uh, a great uh, opportunity in doing this. Uh, 
uh, one is connected to the mission of our office because our office manages the regional law seven, but also the ERDF. So we have the connection inside the institution. And uh, already from this phase of drafting uh, the gender equality plan, there were colleagues from the ERDF that, that followed our activities because they want uh, to introduce uh, the principle we put in the JEP in the managing of ERDF. Plus, uh, there is an opportunity uh, given by the mission of the ERDF. The ERDF, uh, in uh, all the provisions, uh, have uh, some uh, indications uh, that uh, each project uh, and each uh, uh, executive act concerning projects and fundings has to be sensitive to the horizontal principles that are sustainability and equal opportunity. Therefore, inside the office, there is a, um, an institution, a person actually, that is the commission, that is the authority for equal opportunities. In our office, it's uh, Simona Coronju. And uh, uh, the authority for equal opportunities uh, uh, monitors the fact uh, that all the laws uh, connected uh, and all the executive act connected to the funding of the projects uh, are in line with equal opportunity. So there is already a big input in going in that direction and uh, um, an opening to uh, receiving all the suggestion by the JEP. And right now we really, um, uh, Simona is part of the core team of the Supra uh, group, so she's working really in parallel. And uh, other uh, uh, people from the office that manages the different uh, uh, sectors, like, uh, for example, environment, uh, enterprises, uh, uh, energy, express the interest uh, and uh, uh, they're following the, the activities uh, and uh, will uh, introduce, uh, if possible, the principle in the calls for proposals. And, uh, and another thing is the office, the ERDF, as a technical assistance for uh, um, equal opportunities. And with this technical assistance, we can monitor the number of women and men that are accessed to project, uh, the number of beneficiaries, the percentage, uh, and all the data. Uh, and we can have an idea in that sense, uh, and we can act uh, in that sense too. Thank you. Um, there is another question now to WT, WTF on the um, uh, difficulty you mentioned of working manually for that data uh, gathering and analysis. And so how you have solved this? Uh, how did you really put up a, a, a different data management system or you keep on doing it by hand? So um, it's, it's not totally manual. We do have some data that we have collected um, kind of automatically with our online system for applicants and we we can um, extract data from from this database but the analysis of indicators that's still done by hand but we have established a, a routine so to say so I mean we do have this excel spreadsheet with the, the different indicators that we analyze and with every call that is um, finished, so to say, that is um, decided, we add the call and um, can then of course use the existing um, formulas for analyzing the data for that additional call. And we have also set these um, internal um, reminders or these um, deadlines for doing this so that it's not forgotten and um, then needs to be done for several years, like it was now the case when we started with it. Thank you, thank you. Um, another question to Tara again, um, on trying to find it again, um, but it's really on the, on the strategies you followed to engage the stakeholders, as you mentioned, because it's, it's uh, really your main message to say that your success was engagement of stakeholders. Um, but, but what was the strategy to engage them and to keep them engaged as well? It, uh, the strategy 
was to um, uh, start a fair with informal talks and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, to, um, the strategy basically was uh, is in the final slide that I was describing to keep them on board who meant to, to be always in contact with them and to make aware uh, them aware of the fact that we were one of the first region uh, preparing the gender equality plan so giving the sense of a, a great mission of being pioneers and uh, uh, to, uh, to make them participate uh, to our activity the maximum possible uh, so that they could really feel the empowered, not the simple stakeholders giving the opinion and then being left out, but being part, uh, really part of the team uh, and uh, feeling that they were um, key for the success of the gender equality plan, thanks to their competencies. So that was the key to, to, to keep them on board. And also in formal contexts, uh, even when the project uh, uh, is not producing external outputs, for example, when the document uh, is already prepared uh, and when, the, when there is a moment uh, where the project, uh, uh, we are working in the office uh, to make them participate uh, to, to our activities. So that was, uh, that was key for us. There is a more general question, which is not addressed to, to one of you in particular. So keeping it open, who's going to answer? Um, gender balance is fundamental. Um, so the question is, as you know, a gender balance is fundamental to see what is the situation of a research organization. And do you have a template um, or has been doing it by hand is surely very long. And what are the strategies to really increase the presence of, of uh, women in, in, in research? Which brings a question on quota, well, your opinion about quota, which has been mentioned also, also before. Who starts? Maybe Donia? I will start, even if I'm not getting totally the, the question, but maybe I start and then there's a re-question or something. So uh, we as a funding organization, we have to work kind of what is out there. So what is out there in the research organizations. And what we did in the course of the project is really to establish a kind of dialogue about it. So um, when we say, okay, we want to have like applicants 50-50, this is sometimes not possible because out in the field, in the research field, there is not this kind of spread of researchers 50-50. So what we were discussing then was this dynamic quota, like looking out in the field, how, how is the field presenting itself to us, for example, in, in ICT, information communication technology or mathematics, it's something totally different than looking at social sciences and humanities. And there we kind of have this in mind and look then how we could include this in our processes, how we could include this in our juries, for example, because, um, yeah, we, we have to have like an, an very reasonable uh, vision um, what is what is going to happen. Uh, what we did, maybe just one example to get very practical. Um, mentioned before, we have this funding instrument where we try to attract top excellent researchers from outside to bring to Vienna, so bring from World Wealth to Vienna. And what we've seen in the first years when we started 2010 was we had really a problem uh, that we get got female applicants. So why was this so? Um, the thing was, it was a tandem application. So the Viennese research institutions were searching for applicants and then applying in tandem to our fund. And what we've seen that a lot of male professors tend to kind of turn to people, they, their PhD students, their former PhD students, for example, and propose them to us. And then what we were doing is we said, okay, there has to be a very international recruitment procedure and a very competitive recruitment procedure beforehand. And the research organizations have to demonstrate at least that they tried to search worldwide for applicants. And what we've seen is that the percentage of female applicants were rising. And what we also did was then establish a monetary bonus for saying, okay, if a female applicant is successful, then the organization, not the applicant, but the organization gets a kind of a bonus for doing gender mainstreaming activities. And this seemed to be, was very successful in the aspect that it 
kind of enabled a little bit of structural change in the organization. So there were special programs established, mentoring programs, for example, for female researchers at the institutions in Vienna. And it wasn't maybe an immediate effect in our funding, but in the end, it was a structural effect in uh, the whole research landscape, a small one, but at least I think that was a small effect. Was this the question? Sorry. for. I think the, the, the question is very wide and can be answered in very different ways and that, that you did it. <clears throat> I propose we, we go to the last stage of, um, of this uh, short webinar to make sure that we, we end up uh, on time um, or eventually or potentially a little ahead of time because some of the questions you mentioned are also are linked to uh, other initiatives that, that we are preparing. Um, and I will, I will start sharing my screen to present this tool, but I think it's important also on the basis of the questions you formulated um, to explain why we have chosen uh, two, um, how should I say, stories which are comprehensive um, and from regional uh, funding organizations. Up to now, a lot of experience sharing has been uh, done, and I would say in the last 10 years, with examples of uh, national funding organizations and rather big organizations. And the experience sharing from smaller and regionally operating uh, organization is, is, uh, has not been put in the limelight, is also new. Um, we do have examples of measures. Uh, we do have very little examples of actual measurable impact of these measures on the excellence of the research content or on uh, real uh, effects in terms of uh, gender equality. And, and what we would like to do with this networking of uh, research funding organizations, which we are today initiating, is really open up this debate so that we help each other in understanding what works and, and what does not work. And the two first stories were holistic. Uh, why? Because we also believe that uh, to be successful, you need to have structural change and you don't do that measure by measure. It's not by working only on gender bias. It's not only by working on, on quotas and having quotas uh, among your evaluators so that you have a, a good mix and diversity in the, in the evaluation panels. Um, it's not only uh, by um, using gender sensitive language in your, in your promotion. It's, it's really by working on, on everything still and now i'm going to share my screen um, the tool we have developed and which i'm now showing you on what is a miro board miro uh, board um, what you're seeing here is a huge uh, whiteboard like a big wall uh, where you can put uh, your ideas and what we have done is uh, a little bit what Donia and Elizabeth have been telling us. Uh, what they have been doing is looking at the funding cycle. What we have put here on this huge virtual board are examples of experiences that have been identified or reported um, at the different stages of the cycle. So this could be at the stage of the call formulation, which is starting on the left, then going to how do you promote your call for um, uh, proposals and projects, the actual proposal requirements, the evaluation and how the evaluation is done, how decisions for funding are taken, uh, initiatives in terms of implementation and monitoring. On this board, we have collected examples and I will focus on the decision for funding. Um, examples of um, either experiences or resources that are available to regional fund, uh, to uh, uh, funding organizations. So decision for funding, there is this example of criteria used for ranking execo. And in this criteria, you can include gender related criteria. An example is the European Commission uh, is doing that. Uh, there is no link here because we have no um, online resource available at the moment which we can link to to illustrate this criteria. 
Another one is to give bonus criteria. And here there are two, two uh, links, one to an example of a program, which is Stach, um, already mentioned because they are part of the GICO project, and to a resource uh, the, uh, in GenderNet, uh, there is a resource available. Um, another example is having a gender equality certification and award scheme. Uh, this is a long and a complex name to, to uh, and Athena's one would probably be easier to be mentioned here, um, because that's sometimes an eligibility criteria, sometimes a bonus criterion uh, to have uh, uh, obtained one of these uh, certificates or awards can be used by funding organization. As I said, and I'm zooming out, uh, this board is split in different uh, parts. So there are, uh, in the first part, the biggest one, you have general measures. Then you have examples of measures which are linked to the gender balance in teams, uh, measures linked to work-life balance, and also a start uh, around gender equality plans as gender equality plans are going to uh, be uh, increasingly present now that the European Commission has decided that for Horizon Europe, having a gender equality plan will become an eligibility criterion. So uh, these uh, gender, uh, gender equality plans could also be used by other funding organizations as a uh, tool to check on what um, is being done by uh, the applicants. We do realize that, um, and I will stop sharing my screen. We do realize that the um, RFOs are very different. And, and we saw it with the two stories we heard. And we also know it that between a large national ministry and a uh, smaller uh, regionally operating uh, organization like um, uh, the WTF, there, there are uh, huge differences, uh, both in legal uh, requirements and in process and, and, and teams. But what we do realize is that all, region, all funding organizations uh, have something similar, and that is this cycle. So we all have a legal base to start from, and from there we start to formulate goals, which we uh, advertise, we need to help the applicants to find the call, to respond in the right way, and then we need to evaluate and we have to monitor uh, the effect. As we all know that you can, you can cheat the system. You can make sure that on paper you correspond to some criteria you have been setting up as a funding organization, but then in the implementation, uh, the people, when they got the money, they changed their minds, they changed their teams, and they implement it in a, in a different way than what was agreed. So we, we all share that uh, common part. And with this tool, we would like to start a dialogue on, um, with, with all of you, uh, funding organizations, research funding organizations, to identify new um, experiences and to start sharing on how to implement it. And so the next one we're going to make, and again, I'm sharing my screen. So we will have a next I start having the same problems as my colleagues in yeah okay it works um, our next webinar will be next week already uh, and we'll uh, handle gender bias so the two experiences we will hear are of uh, uh, research funding organizations that have uh, started to um, fight against this gender bias in a, two different ways, both in how do you analyze this bias and then how do you go against it. Um, so it's a, it's a first example. Uh, we will uh, organize more of these webinars and quite certainly one of the next ones will be on uh, how do you handle uh, gender in research content and, and, and excellence. Um, um, but we have not yet decided neither on the, on the date nor on the, on the final thematic for uh, this next webinar. And after having done such webinars, we would like to get into more um, dialogue with you and understanding better your needs so that 
in 2021, um, we can start maybe organizing workshops in smaller groups uh, with uh, RFOs that have common interests around uh, understanding what works and what doesn't work and how to increase the impact of certain type of measures. I wish to thank you all uh, for and, and the whole team in Supera for having participated in this uh, first webinar. And if you are not yet registered for the, and if you have time, um, we would appreciate if you can join us all uh, next Wednesday. I thank the speakers, uh, the Supera team, both uh, Paola for communication and Paola for the organization. Um, and thank you all for having uh, participated actively in this first webinar. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, goodbye. Uh, thank you very much to all, goodbye.